The next group are the beetles, and <clears throat> although you only need to know a handful, beetles are actually the largest group of organisms on Earth. One quarter of all animals on Earth, including mammals and birds and everything else, are just beetles. Um, huge group. The first group, the sphenidae, are the water pennies, and the larvae are just that. They look like little copper pennies that stay on the substrate in the water. They are super sensitive to any kind of organic or inorganic pollutions, and so they once again are placed in group one. Um, very recognizable, uh, very good indicator. If you ever catch these in a stream as you're sampling, you know that you have a nice clean stream. Second group of beetles are the elmid or the riffle beetles. They get their name because more often than not, you will find them in the riffle and nowhere else in a stream. You very rarely find them in any kind of a, a lentic or a pond or a lake situation. The larvae look like little mealworms. So if you've ever had uh, a pet frog or a lizard or anything, you've fed them mealworms, these look like just small two millimeter versions of those. But to confirm that, you want to look at the last abdominal segment on the underside, as you see it in the arrow, and that is known as an operculum. That's essentially their gills are tucked under there, but when you see that operculum, can't mistake it for any other larva of a, of a beetle than the riffle beetles. Now these are, once again, sensitive to pollution and they are placed in group one, as are the adults of riffle beetles. Adults look like small flax seeds almost. Long legs, strong claws, they are actually grabbing on to that substrate, the rocks on the substrate, and they're actually walking in that strong flow of water, so they need a, a strong legs to hold on there. They will often be found, which is unusual for organisms, the larvae and adults, they are actually found in the same habitat. So you will find the adults and the larvae when you're sampling in those riffle zones. As I mentioned, the adults of riffle beetles are placed in group one because they are sensitive, just like the larvae are, and you will um, often not find them, even if there's a slight bit of siltation or, or inorganic pollution. So when we're looking at this huge, large group of organisms, with all the beetles, and many of the other larvae of beetles <clears throat> look very similar, uh, rather than the elmids or, or one of the other groups. They might be mistaken for caddisflies, but the way you tell is always look at that back end. If you don't see prolegs with hooks, then you know it's not a caddisfly. The beetle larvae will sometimes have the cerci or breathing tubes sticking off the back end, but never will they have those hooks. They will also have lateral filaments coming off the sides of their abdomens, as you can see here. These are usually used for tactile, in other words, for sensing if there's any prey or if there are any uh, other predators surrounding them. They are more tolerant to pollution, so they are placed in group two. You will find these in ponds as well as streams. The only other adult beetle that you need to know besides those riffle beetle adults are known as the gyrinids or the whirligig beetles. Uh, they get their name because they swim in little drunken circles on top of the water, little irregular circles, and they keep going around and around and around and it just seems like they don't know where they're going, like they like have a broken rudder and they, they can only turn left or right. When you look at them, they look like little black colored beans uh, floating on the top of the water or else they look like little, little boats. Uh, unsinkable boats because if you try to tap on them and sink them they actually just pop back up to the surface. But when you look at their faces they do have the compound eyes which is typical of, of adult insects. They actually, their eyes are actually split and it looks like they do not have four eyes but it looks like they have four eyes. Two of those eyes actually see above the water and two of them see below the water. So that's the great indicator if it looks kind of like a little black oval boat look at those eyes and if it looks like they have four it's nothing else but a gyrinid. Now these, like other beetle larvae, these are placed in group two because they are moderately tolerant to any kind of organic or inorganic pollution. The corydalids, they're actually in a larger group called the nerve-winged insects, the neuroptera, uh, the dobson flies. Now the larvae have a very distinct name of helgramites uh, because they are very large, they get to be two to three inches and they're very fierce if you try to pick one up, you probably get a good pinch from their jaws, which are found on the front end. <clears throat> Once again, you may confuse these with, say, a beetle larva or, or possibly a trichoptera larva. But look at those lateral filaments. All right, they're very, very long. They are used solely for tactile purposes and others feeling themselves around. If you look at the base 
of those lateral filaments. They actually have little tufted gills, which you will not see in beetle larvae. And to confirm that they are helgramites, look at the back end. They do have two prolegs, but they have two claws on the end of each proleg, whereas Trichoptera or the caddisfly larvae only have one claw. So two claws, Dobson fly, for sure, the, uh, the Helgramite, the larvae. Now these are sensitive to any kind of pollution. They are placed in group one. The adults, very recognizable. Probably if you've ever been outside on a summer night uh, near any kind of a, a porch light or a street light, you've seen these flying around or landing on the ground. They do hold their wings flat over their back, but they're generally splayed to the side. So it's not like a stonefly where they're directly flat over the back. They're usually eh, at a little bit of angle. Now, when you look at the male, they have these large, fierce looking jaws, and it looks like, oh, I don't want to touch that thing because it's going to give me a good pinch. Pfft, harmless. What you want to watch out for is the female there on the left. Even though those little stout jaws don't look like you can do much, that's the one that's going to give you the big pinch. And the males actually use those large jaws to keep the females at bay so they don't. Uh, start chomping on them. All right, next group are the, yay, the best group uh, that exists in the insect world, the Diptera, the true flies. The first one that we're looking at are the midges or the Chironomidae. Uh, when you look at Chironomidae larvae, they all, just like mayflies, they have that similar appearance. To me, they always look like little bananas uh, floating around in the water or swimming around in the water. There's not many, there aren't many other characters to them. They do have a, a small hardened head capsule on their front end. But when you look at their body itself, the banana portion, you will see a pair of prolegs just behind their head on that prothorax, and then you'll see a pair on the back end. So no other groups we're looking at have prolegs front and back end. When you find these, generally in a really, really polluted situation, because they are in group three, they can be in uh, very nasty situations. When you find some that are bright red, they are known as bloodworms. And if you ever hear people talking about, oh, I found a bunch of bloodworms, or they, they uh, go fishing, they use bloodworms. This is simply because they can be in that dirty, dirty water. Uh, that's why they're placed in group three. They actually have hemoglobin in their circulatory system, so they have better uh, able to capture oxygen in that the water that might be very lowly uh, oxygenated. All right, the second group of flies are the typulids or the crane flies. Now these, as one of my professors described it, they look like Vienna sausages uh, swimming around in the water. They can get very big and robust and uh, succulent if you like to eat uh, fly larvae. <clears throat> they do have a head, but often you won't see it because they can retract that hardened head capsule into their prothorax. So it looks like they just have a blunt, mushy end on the front. But the thing to look for is on the back end of their abdomen. They will actually have finger-like, anywhere from five to seven finger-like projections. And these actually surround the spiracles and they will go to the surface of the water. That breaks the water tension and they actually breathe atmospheric oxygen through those spiracles on the back end. These are slightly tolerant to any kind of pollution, so they are placed in group two. <clears throat> the second last group we'll be looking at are the black flies, the simuleidae. Right? To me, these things always look like bowling pins. They are narrower at the head end, they're wider at the back end. They do have one proleg, and the only place you're going to see that proleg is just underneath the head on that prothorax. The back end is widened. And what they do is they will spin a little mat of silk on the substrate, usually on rocks. They will attach hooks on their back end into that, and they will stand, as you can see on the picture on the right, they will stand upright in that water column. And using these mouth brushes, the things that look like antennae are not. They are actually brushes, part of their mouth parts, and they use them and they filter out detritus that's flowing in the water. And they will actually consume that. They will actually scrape it off of those, those uh, combs. So these are, once again, tolerant to pollution. They are placed in group three, which is the most tolerant to pollution. The last group we're going to be looking at are the horse flies and deer flies, but primarily the horse flies. These are possibly confused with the crane flies, but when you look at them, you won't see any projections on the back end. They are tapered at both ends, and around the abdominal segments, they will have very, very short, stubby projections ringing each of their abdominal segments. No other group you're looking at uh, will have that. These are placed in group B, and a lot of times you will find them in, say, settling ponds or kind of nasty situations where there where uh, may not be anything else uh, able to survive. 
So in summary, what do you want to look for when you're identifying these things? You definitely want to look for key characters for each group. You know, are there prolegs present? Are there gills present? You know, where are those prolegs? Where are the gills located? You know, how many of the claws do they have on those prolegs? You have to narrow it down in your head. Always look for more than one character if possible. So if you know there are a pair of prolegs, also look for those claws. Do they have two claws? Do they have three claws? Or if you're trying to differentiate a stonefly from a mayfly, even if you see tails on the back end, look for where those gills are. If the gills are on the abdomen, then it's a mayfly. If the gills are on the thorax on the underside, then it's definitely a stonefly. And the last thing is sometimes it's just a process of elimination. You start off at zero, ooh, I'm not sure what this thing is. Go through those characters. You're doing a dichotomous key in your head. You're basically saying it has this or it doesn't. Doesn't have that, okay, you know it's not these groups of things. Just keep eliminating till you get to the solution. And that's the best way to do it.